So actually, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about history instead of cryptography to tell you where the name Durandal comes from. So Durandal was the sword of a knight called Roland in France during the 8th century AD. And the story tells that um, when Roland was about to die in a battle, he did not want the sword to fall into enemy's hand. And so first he tried to break the sword onto a rock, and the sword actually broke the rock, effectively creating the breach of Roland. You can look that up if on Google if you want, and you can see it in the Pyrenees in France. So he decided to throw, to throw the sword away, and it ended up in this rock in Rocamadour in France, um, about 300 kilometers away. So because of all of that, uh, Durandal actually means the one which lasts, so I hope this is a well-suited name for our crypto system. <laughs> now I'm going to start with some um, motivations for this work. So in code-based cryptography in general, we have pretty good um, results for public key encryption schemes and key exchange mechanisms. We have several um, security and performance trade-offs, re reductions to well-known problems, things like that. But uh, signature schemes are much more difficult to grasp. And in the rank metric in particular, we had this rank sign proposal to the first round of the NIST PQC uh, standardization process. And it was broken because uh, rank sign was an Ashen sign signature scheme. And so what you do is that you ash your message and you need to invert the syndrome you obtain with a trapdoor that is hidden in the keys. And it turned out that um, the structure could not be hidden in the public key, so the scheme had ended up broken. And meanwhile, in the lattice-based cryptography, you have this Schnorr-Lubashevsky framework kind of approach that has a really nice property that is that not rely on this kind of hidden structure. So this work is about adapting this framework to the rank metric, plus adding a new idea because, as I will show, um, if you do a straightforward adaptation to this approach, it turns out that the scheme is broken in the rank metric. So what is the rank metric? Uh, during the talk, we are only con going to consider codes with coefficient in fq to the m. And to define the rank weight of a vector x of length n, what we are going to do is that for each coordinate of x um, that lies in fq to the m, we are going to unfold it in a basis of fqm over fq. And this will give us a column vector of length n. So by doing that for each coordinate, we obtain a matrix of size m times n over fq. And we will call the rank weight of x the rank of its associated matrix and the distance between x and y the rank of the difference of the respective associated matrices. Another important notion is the notion of support of a word. Um, so we still have our vector x of length n, and we will call the support of a word denoted support of x, or capital E in this slide, uh, the fq subspace of fqm generated by the coordinates of x. And by definition, the dimension of a support of a word is exactly the rank weight of this word. We are going to consider FQM linear codes. So these are more well suited for cryptography than FQ linear codes in the rank metric. Um, the definition is pretty similar to the one in the Amig metric, except that um, the scalars lie in FQM instead of F2, usually. So an FQM linear code is an FQM subspace of FQM to the n of dimension k. And to represent such a code, we can either do that by a generator matrix or party check matrix. Um, this can be really expensive and not really, it can lead to large keys. So we are going to add an additional structure to this code. Um, the structure is called aldeol codes. So what we are going to do is that uh, we have some vectors of length n. And we are going to associate a polynomial of degree n minus 1 to these vectors. So here, g1, for example. And there is an an isomorphism between these polynomials and uh,
Thank you. So I was saying that uh, there is an isomorphism between polynomials and n times l square matrices. So what we're going to do to build such a matrix from a polynomial of degree n minus one is that on the first row, you just write uh, the coefficients of your polynomials. And then for each row, you multiply it by x. So this shifts the polynomial kind of, and you reduce it modulo p. p is a polynomial of degree n with coefficients in fq. And the fact that we take the coefficients in fq ensures that um, the rank weight and the support of the word is, um, is kept the same between each line. If you know about uh, quasi-cyclic codes, um, taking p equal to x to the n minus 1 um, is the same definition. You get quasi-cyclic codes. And what's interesting is that now to describe the matrix G, we only need to describe the first row. So this would lead to smaller keys. All right. So now I'm going to talk about hard problems for our scheme. The most well-known problem in the rank metric is the rank syndrome decoding problem. So we are given H, a parity check matrix of a cause, S, a syndrome, and an integer W. What we want to find is an error vector E, such that H times E equals S, and we have a constraint on the weight of E. So if this constraint is low enough, the problem will be hard, but if you take uh, W to be high enough, the problem becomes easy, actually. So this has to be well chosen in the parameters such that the problem is hard. Of course, this could be specialized for any family of codes. For ideal codes, we will denote this problem IRSD. Um, now this is a more recent problem, the RSL problem. It can be seen as a generalization of the RSD problem. So this time we are still given H, a parity check matrix of a code. But this time, instead of being given a syndrome, we are given access to an oracle that will output uh, syndromes each time we do a request. And the particularity is that each error vector E um, has its coordinates laying in the same support, capital E. So this is kind of a variant on the RSD problem, where instead of having only one syndrome, you are given multiple syndromes. And you know that there is um, some kind of structure in the support of the errors. All right, so now I'm going to recall quickly what is a signature scheme. So it consists of four algorithms, the setup one that gives the parameters, the key gen that gives the public key and the secret key. You can sign a message mu under a uh, secret key sk, and you can verify the signature sigma um, to check whether it is valid or not on you, on mu. And the uh, security we are targeting is uh, formally EUF CMA. So if an adversary obtains uh, valid signatures over some messages, it should be hard for him to output uh, a valid signature on a fresh message, mu. So a mu that was not requested during the first phase. Now this is the straightforward adaptation to the um, rank metric of the Lubashevsky framework. So to generate the keys, we choose H, a random parity check matrix of a code. And we choose a um, matrix S that we call homogeneous matrix because each of its coordinates lie in a secret support E of dimension R. And another part of the public key is T, the product of H by S. And this is an instance of the RSL problem because each column of S can be seen as an error vector of the same support E, and each column of T can be seen as a syndrome. All right, so to sign a message, you first choose a random vector Y of weight W. You then compute a challenge using a hash function. So you hash H times Y and the message mu. Uh, actually, this Hash functions gives challenge in um, of small weight, and we will denote f the support of the challenge. You then compute z equals y plus cs, and zc is a signature. The verify step is pretty simple. You check that the weight of z is low enough, so this ensures that the signature wasn't forged by an attacker. 
Uh, this has to be chosen low enough such that the RSD problem is hard. And then you just check that HZ minus TC equals HY, basically. The correctness is pretty easy to understand because when you compute HY, you get HZ, sorry, you get HY, and then the second term cancels with that because T equals H times S. So this is a pretty simple and efficient scheme, but as I said, it is broken. So we'll, we will see why. Uh, we are going to look at the support of Z, so because um, Z is Y plus CS, the support of Z is included in W, which is the support of Y, plus the product space of E, the secret support of the secret key, and F, the support of the challenge C. Uh, actually, we will consider that uh, the support of Z is exactly W plus EF, which uh, happens with a really good probability. And this support has, um, you can write a basis of this support this way. So x1 to x xw is a basis of w. And then you have this kind of product space here. So because of this structure, you can actually use techniques from the decoding of low rank parity check codes um, to recover the support E. So what we are going to do is that you take a basis of F, and for each element, you invert it, and you multiply each of these by the inverse of fi. And because of the product space structure, um, E will be included of in all of these supports. So we just have now to intersect all of them, and we recover the secret support. Which means that signatures leak information from the secret key, and actually you only need one signature to recover the whole secret key. So we need a new idea to counteract this attack. All right, so now I'm going to present you our scheme with the new idea I just talked about. The key gen is essentially the same as before, but you can, the matrix S is now split into two matrices, S and S prime. And what's more interesting is the signing process. So the first two steps are the same. But now, in the first step, we are going to add this term PS to the signature. Uh, P has the same support as the um, challenge C. And as a signer, we get to choose uh, the value of P. And this gives us uh, some, um, oh, sorry, gives us some degree of liberty to um, choose kind of a subspace of the of the space W plus EF, and we are going to change the support of Z such that it lies in a subspace of the present support. And actually, because we get to choose P, we can target a specific support, and we are going to choose support uh, carefully so that the attack does not work anymore. So now the signature consists of Z, C, and P. And the verify adaptation is pretty straightforward. So you add lambda here because you just reduce the weight of the support. And you add this term TP in the hash function. So what are that, why does that work? Um, when we're adding PS to the signature, we are choosing support uh, for Z such that there is no element of the form EF where E um, lies in the secret support and F lies in the support of the challenge, in the support of Z. And if there is no element of this form, we can not use the decoding of LRPC codes anymore. Which does not mean that signatures do not leak information from the secret key. So we defined a new problem called the PSSI problem. Uh, the definition here is pretty wordy, but it's actually pretty simple to understand. You have E, the secret support, and then uh, each time you make a request to an oracle, you have F of um, weight D and W of weight W that are chosen randomly, and UI is actually a subspace that has the same property as the support of Z uh, during the signature phase. And this problem asks to determine whether um, Samples are generating from the signature scheme or 
where z are come are just random of the right weight. So um, this is pretty technical, but in the paper we give arguments that uh, signatures as are pretty close to random. So just check the paper if you want more details. And this is the main theorem of our work. So under the PSSI assumption, the decisional RSL assumption and the ideal RSL assumption, our scheme is EUFCMA secure. So again, I'm going to skip the proof for now, but you can check the paper if you want. All right, so uh, what does it give in terms of parameters? We gave uh, two sets of parameters in the paper. As you can see, we have public key sizes of order 20 kilobytes and signature sizes of respectively four and five kilobytes. So the scheme is really efficient. These are reasonable signature sizes in particular. And in terms of timings, um, so keygen and verification are really fast. The timings here are given in milliseconds, but as you can see, the signature phase is kind of slow. But an interesting feature is that you can split the signature phase into an offline signature phase where you don't need your server to be on off online, sorry. And you don't have to know what message you are going to sign to perform this phase. So you can do that ahead of time. And then if you've done all that, uh, then the online signature phase is really efficient. So to summarize, we built a new efficient signature scheme that is an adaptation of the Lubashevsky framework in the rank metric with a new idea to counteract the basic attack for the straightforward adaptation. It is proved EUFCMA secure. And as an open question, we tried to adapt this to the Hamming metric, but because there is no equivalent of the RSL problem, it does not seem to work, or at least this is not that easy. Thank you. So, do you have any questions for Nicola? Um, please use the microphone on the side. Um, what's the security level of the parameters that you proposed? Because that uh, determines uh, if this 128. is... 128 yeah, against 100 classical 100. or quantum attacks? Classical. What would you get if you do like NIST security level 5 or 3? Mm, actually, the limiting factor for our attacks is the distinguisher for the PSSI problem. So I don't, mm, I don't think there is a quantum attack that would really target that. So uh, I don't know, this would need more analysis, I think. Okay, thanks. Um, was there a second question? Okay. okay, so if there's no more questions, let's thank Nicola again. Thank you. Thank you.